Welcome to Constructive Conversations, Building Canada Stories. I'm your host, George Affleck. Thanks for joining me as we dig into the foundations of Canada's construction industry, learning from leaders and pioneers in the business. Today, I'm joined by Len Neufeld, the CEO and founder of Three Way Builders. Three Way Builders began as a framing carpentry business that's transitioned into a leading commercial construction company. Let's start the conversation now. Len, thanks uh, so much for uh, joining me today on Constructive Conversations. I, can you tell me a bit more about your own personal journey to how um, you've got to where you are today? Because you start, you were like 20 when you started this, and it kind of evolved you know, in a big way from that age on. Well, that's, uh, that's true. I'm, uh, I kind of uh, grew up with my brothers in construction, so uh, they were framing carpenters. So I joined them when I was still in, well, during summer in high school. And uh, yeah, I kind of, uh, and when I, when I was uh, 20, I, I always tell my wife that I, uh, yeah, I went home and uh, I, I quit my job. Actually, I was, first of all, I started, I started framing in, with my brothers in, in uh, spring of uh, 78. So I was a uh, 20-year-old kid, and um, by the end of the summer, I was uh, supposed to be in charge of that job, and uh, I decided, you know, I could probably do this on my own, and the guy we were working for was kind of uh, almost uh, had gone almost bankrupt so I was uh, I decided well I could probably do as good a job on my own so I uh, decided to quit my job and I quit my job the day before I got married so I uh, I keep going you know I'd say if Mike if my son-in-law had tried that on me I would have been a little a little disturbed but uh, you know it was it was one of those things uh, early on so you know, so I was I was a subcontractor. I was framing houses uh, mostly in some agricultural work when I first started, and that kind of evolved into into uh, you know doing some multifamily framing. And then I went through several partners on the subcontract work. So you know, by the time I, I think in 1987, I bought a partner out and switched my model to uh, business model from subcontracting to more. Uh, uh, general contracting and design build design build kind of stuff so i mean that's it's to go from you know your 20s to to now uh you know that's an evolution as a person uh, and you say you have partners how does you know you know expanding and changing your service offerings like that how complicated was that or is it just kind of happen naturally well it, it's um so i had um I really, uh, you know, went through, through, I mean, partnerships are complicated. So, yes. uh, you know, I started off with, uh, you know, I had a few bumps in the road. My first partner, you know, he got cancer after three months, so he, he yeah. had to quit. Uh, oh. I had another partner. And when we picked up some bigger jobs, then we joined, two of his brothers joined me. So we had three brothers and myself. Uh, that only lasted about a year and didn't really work out. So I moved into another phase with one partner. Uh, subcontract work and we did a lot of work uh, because at that point I'd said I wasn't going to go after the work that these other guys had so we ended up working in northern Manitoba a lot of northern work as a subcontractor and what happened uh, there is that we actually ended up uh, I, I learned a lot because uh, we learned logistics for one thing we had to do a lot of you know we were in kind of more remote areas uh, I learned uh, they, they tasked me with a lot of the subcontract work so although I was a a framer to begin with when we worked in in north as a subcontractor i was actually doing you know concrete framing roofing exterior finishing drywall um, you know i did almost everything but i was doing it on on a subcontract basis and uh, for a general contractor so by the time uh, you know i i went uh changed my model to to a uh, the change to general contractor i already was was had a, had experience in in coordinating everything, so it was a much easier transition to do that. And uh, the other thing that you know, at that point when I switched, I also bought out my partner. So uh, it was just, my wife and I owned the company uh, 100% at that time. But it was 100% of nothing because we really were starting over. It was <laughs> got through some difficult years, so so it was really uh, starting over. So well, I hit those I mean, high interest rates, you know, 
Yeah, oh, yeah, you've, you've been through it all. I think yeah. from the early '80s to now, and now you might be feeling a little like it's the early '80s again with what's going on out there. Well, um, no, I, I, you know, in those days, I started building my first house when the interest rate was fifteen percent, and it ended up at twenty-four percent. So, you know, the young people today have nothing to worry about. <laughs> well, unless it gets to twenty four percent, then we're all worried. Oh, that's true. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you know, you're kind of a one stop shop now, and I think having that experience, as you describe, where you're literally hands on on every aspect uh, of the construction business, that must really set you up, as you say, to really build a business that you know that one stop approach and, and how it can help you be successful, right? Yeah, it's uh, you know there are a lot of uh, a lot of design build contractors, but they're they're relatively few, at least in our in our uh, area, that have in house design capabilities. So uh, early on, I actually hired somebody uh, who could uh, you know do project management, but he was also a designer. So we did uh, we really started out where we could actually do a lot of the uh, particularly the preliminary work uh, with our clients in house, and that really. Uh, streamlines the process, and I think it it uh, you actually uh, the communication gap is narrowed uh, between the client and and the design team because of your that just makes because it faster. in house. So so we're coordinating yeah. our own people, not not coordinating an outside uh, entity. So that makes a that makes a big difference. That comes with risk. You, you're putting your you know having. That kind of team in place all the time. That means you got to keep, you know, new business has got to be coming in all the time to to justify that. Yeah, and we don't do uh, exclusively uh, that. Are we our, our guys are always busy, but there, we don't have enough uh, staff there to do to fill all of our our backlog. So we actually do a, a combination. So we also work with. We actually work on you know design build is one as that's our preferred aspect, but we also do construction management where we, where there'd be an outside architect. Uh, oftentimes, and and we do some some tender, you know, hard bed work, but that's our least preferred and our least. Uh, we have the least amount of of uh, of work in our portfolio that would be hard bed. Uh, we just yeah, think those, it's, uh, uh, we just we, <laughs> we truly believe that the best value for the client is is the design build where it's a single source responsibility. There are always gaps when you go, you know, I don't care if you're construction management or, or hard bid, there's always gaps. On a design build, um, you know, the gaps have to be covered by the design build contractor, other than if there's unforeseen site conditions or a, an owner owner uh, change. Yeah. But otherwise, baby, you know, right? yeah, yeah it, it's really, uh, this is what you're getting for this number. Mm -hmm. So that's... Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a much more I think much more seamless uh, approach for the owners. I think it gives them a better. It's a one. It's a single source to go to. Three way builders is. I mean, I look at some of the case, case you know testimonials, the case studies, the, the kinds of buildings you do. It's quite diverse from you know some retail stuff to industrial stuff to you know uh, resorts. Um, do the same principles of design and build go into each of those? How do you how do you actually have that? Because quite often companies will be okay. We're niching into this, you know, yeah. this kind of stuff. But you're actually in at least I could see three or four different niches that are quite different. And and how do you manage that? How do you how well, do you balance those design uh, build differences? Yeah, well, we we live in a province of 1.3 million people, so 55 percent of those are in the city of Winnipeg. So if a con for a contractor in our climate to be able to say we're going to specialize only in this sector. Uh, there isn't enough work to really build, you know, to really to really build a good uh, base on that sector alone. So we've always uh, felt we've had to be diversified, and you know, it 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 is a challenge because there are very there are very different. So when you're going to, you know, an indus, uh, industrial building, so a manufacturing building, we you know, example, we did a we did a, a plant for uh, for a, a concrete paving cover. So they make. Uh, decorative uh, paving stones and those kinds of things. So that that looks like a very straightforward building. You know, it's it's maybe it's 40, 50 feet high in an area and 30 feet in another area and looks like a steel building, uh, which which it is. However, inside that building, you have to accommodate for all of the equipment. So in that case, we did the design build on it and uh, uh, 
uh, what we were what we had to do is we had to communicate our design people had to communicate with a uh, German company Hess uh, from uh, that end for equipment that they were going to uh, be supplying. We had to uh, we had to communicate with Stanley out of the United States. They were giving us everything in in uh, English measurements. Germany was giving us everything in metric, and we had to make sure that it all uh, corresponded within our within our to total design. And uh, and then you know make sure that the machine was uh, machines were going to fit, and in that particular case we had a very uh, specific requirement. We had very uh, it's a very solid soil condition which causes vibrations uh, outside. Now the build, a machine like that vibrates an extensive vibration, and when the owners heard that they were very concerned because there was a residential area right across the street. So we actually had to engage a separate engineering firm and, and design something, a base on that machine in order to, to make sure that the vibrations were not going to transfer over the street. So that's kind of a, it looks like a very simple build, <laughs> but when you actually get inside of it, there's a lot of uh, complex, when you're doing design build, if we were only doing the construction, of course, we would look at the drawings and, and provide what they had, but we were, a, a, it's kind of a unique uh, place. But then when you're going to, um, you know, when you go to that, that's very, uh, well, that's one side of com uh, complexity. And then we look at another side, we did uh, a credit union building in the city of Winnipeg. It had sloped walls, for example, outside sloped glass uh, walls. And, uh, you know, that's a completely different complexity. It had a geothermal uh, heating cooling system uh, that ran under the parking lot. You know, we actually worked with the owner to, change that system because we didn't feel uh, that it was going to work properly the way it had been designed. Uh, it would work properly, but we felt that it would cause problems on the on the uh, future problems on the parking lots, which um, which the owners uh, agreed with. And we actually ended up redesigning the uh, the geothermal, even though we were construction managers on there, uh, we actually worked to provide a system that has worked very well for them over the years. So. There's a lot of there's a totally different uh, totally different take on those two things, and then you go to you know church buildings, which are a completely different uh, set of uh, requirements with acoustics and uh, all of those things. So it is complicated, but but the fact is that uh, we have to be able to in our market be able to maybe we have to do more research, maybe we have to be more uh, uh, more interested in in how does that work and what does that what is what are the needs of that particular client so it takes time it takes uh, uh energy and it takes a willingness to listen to what uh, people need and try and fit that together it must make it pretty interesting though for your, you and your team like th these are problem solving situations which makes your day-to-day -day life a little, a little more diverse you know it's not just go oh, okay build this same thing over and over again you're actually so i mean to, to, to actually go in and think about how i can i change my your geothermal system i mean that's not something you plan for when you were 20 building you know houses that is uh, that is a far <laughs> distance away from that no it isn't but you know i'm i really believe in continuous learning and uh, you know we uh uh we've been uh, you know one of my first jobs uh or early on jobs, I did some agricultural work, which we don't do a lot of agricultural work anymore, but at one point we did. So we pivoted a few times, but uh, you know, there was a job, uh, uh, there was a Japanese company that was moving into Manitoba and they had determined that Manitoba, they were going to get in pork production. And they're, the, they determined uh, that the best place to do pork production in the world was Manitoba, North Winnipeg and Interlake. Okay. So they actually set up operations here and they were looking for somebody to build a hog operation for them. So complete from furrowing right to finishing. So complete system. And uh, so I was, I was a young guy. I was in my early thirties, I think. And uh, nobody actually thought that we were going to be in the running for that job. But, you know, I, I didn't know what I didn't know, but I, I went and read, I went and read up, I read, I bought, I got some books and I started reading on up on Japanese business and then the culture. Uh, so when I got to the table with the Japanese client and I, you know, I, I was, I saw him, you know, going, uh, it, I knew because I read on this that he wasn't saying yes, he was just saying that he was listening. 
So, you know, I understood that and I started, tried to coach my, my presentation in those ways that was going to work. And, you know, at the end of the day, we won that job. And, uh, you know, that, that was a real thrill. Uh, and, and, you know, and then, of course, we had to execute and there are a lot of things that, that, we, that we did, which was, was really quite interesting in that whole, whole development. In the final end, uh, their chairman died. Nobody else had interest in it and, and they sold off. So they never oh did develop God. it more than that original facility. So. Really? It's curious, <laughs> yeah. though. I mean, I've never thought about that whole industry being yeah. some, and that being something that Manitoba would be a place for. But uh, you learn about this stuff all the time. Um, yeah. Well, it was I mean, logistics. They, they, were, they had a global outlook. And they were okay. looking at, at uh, flying mm-hmm. uh, product out of Gimli, Manitoba, over the top. And they, they had this whole global outlook as to where they would require Food, huh. for food in the future, and how could they deliver it? Interesting. So, yeah. Wow. I mean, is that when you think about favorite projects or or projects that uh, you know, or your ideal client? I mean, that can't obviously that's not an ideal client because it's so obscure in some ways. Is there an ideal client that you love working for that your team are like, all oh, right, we got one, we got one of those clients. Uh, what is that client? You know. You know, we've got we've got some uh, we worked hard at organizational clarity. So what we what we say is, I mean, you can say we um, we actually say in our, on our company that we uh, we exist to create a better life for others. So that's kind of our our base okay. base. But we also say that we will do that through having fun, doing what we love, and um, you know, uh, being passionate about our work and doing the right thing. So that's kind of a you know, it's it's kind of sounds maybe the like pie in the sky, but it actually, when you really get to that, that's how we try and build our culture. And then the final end, we what do we do? I mean, we we design build design and build buildings, but yeah. but in the process of that, it's not so much an ideal client. It it, it is an it's it's the it's the fun in doing it. I think I think what we can do for clients is take the um, most people think construction is, is a, just a, man. We just don't want to do this because it's just a hard thing to do. It's just a terrible process, you know. I think we can take that out of there and put something in there for the client that says, "Hey, this wasn't so bad, you know. It was it was actually pretty good." So, our but what we I guess for for myself, what I really, you know, there are certain jobs that you do that you say, "Well, you know, it's just another job," uh, because I mean it it provides a function. But I think for us. It's not so much the the build. Anybody can build a building, but it's who it's what happens in that building later on. Like, uh, which is really kind of for us. If we if we see what can we do a building that that provides meaning for the that's always a little better for me. So so when I think about that, you know, uh, we just finished um, uh, we just finished a, a smaller building, but it was it was a building for uh, that runs. Uh, for for older people so it's it's a, it looks like a big house with 10 10 rooms in it for uh for seniors that is but it's run in the private system on a, on a home care system which it's just such a calming facility and you walk in and the people are happy and they're they're providing care for them uh that is far different than in the public se- the sector and you know the the things that you that you hear about what's going on in the after and and for you know I can say because my mother's in there but you know it it's just it's an amazing uh, environment so we could build anybody could really build that building but to be able to see what happens in that building what's it for what does it create I think that's a that those are kind of things that are that's a little bit more than just we, we like to build them all but it's just, that's a little bit more uh special yes you know the nonprofits. we we've done some some children's camps we did a tim horton's children's camp uh you know it, it, it's just a great facility and you just know what what are they going to deliver uh we did another we did several camps we did another uh, big uh, project for a church camp and you know just to see what you know you do the facility but then you see what difference it makes in people's lives that's always a great thing that's but i mean yeah. uh, that's part of what you do it, it's just those are just some of the like yeah, but you could just you could build and walk away and not you know whatever. There you go. I mean, to, when you talk about ideal, when you think about it, it's the finished product and your your motto and all you know here we're building this place for to have it be ideal on the inside and and experience all that stuff. That's really important, and I think that must influence 
the way you design and build, it's not just a simple thing of just putting walls up and uh, you got to really do your research and understand the, the client and, and really believe in what they're doing. And, and that should resonate when you finish the product, you know, the building. Yeah, and we enjoy it. I mean, it, it yeah. is more, you know, I, I don't think I, I would have stayed in this business if I was just doing hard bid. It's yeah. it's no relationship. If you want to yeah. if you want to tender a job, hey, all you got to be is low by low bid. I mean, the, this the, the thinking uh, that you know you're going to build the best buildings if you hire the cheapest contractor, who hires the cheapest sub trader, who buys the cheapest material, who's going to buy the cheapest labor, and he's going to build a building that you want to last for a hundred years. Well, where did that concept ever come from? Yeah, I don't think the Egyptians would have done well with their pyramids if they'd gone on that approach for sure. Yeah. You know, and yet you talked a bit about the labor there, and I think that's one of the things I, that's been through all these conversations I've had over the last year and a bit. You know, labor has been an issue. We touched on it at the beginning. Obviously, the economy, everything's changing right now. But you know, labor still seems to be the number one thread I'm hearing. Uh, how do you? You know, I think that when you're not doing that kind of bid process and you're focusing on the product and product and in the end building and you're not going after cheapest, that must influence how you find great people that work for you and makes it easier to find good people. Well, uh, I don't know if it makes it easier. What, uh, you know, I mean, we have we have people as human resources is a huge challenge. Um, I think the uh, you know, we actually look very uh you know, hiring people is one thing. Hiring the right people is another thing. And and what I'm saying by that isn't that that a person comes in and we don't hire him. Isn't that he's not the right person for somebody else? I think we, what we try to do is find a person that fits within the culture that we have and has a predisposition to the values that we hold dear. So, so we there might be a very good person, but he might just not fit within our culture. So, to find the right person, I think is the is the key. So, you know, we've um, uh, you know we've 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 been reading the book, The Ideal Team Player. We've read that by Patrick Lencioni, and uh, you know that model of how do you find somebody who's uh, you know humble, hungry, and smart. So those three things. So you know we're trying to find people that fit within that mold. So. So, um, you know, we're, we've been fairly successful and not, not a hundred percent, you know, sometimes you, uh, you find that people don't fit within your culture and, and very often they will leave because they realize it's not suited for them. And, um, I think that's really, uh, uh, that's really what we try to key into. So can we find people? I think, uh, we do, uh, we do, we have another logistical issue that we're outside of the city of Winnipeg. So we're, uh, you know, our head office is, you know, 35 minutes, 40 minutes outside of the city of Winnipeg. And so we also have to find those people that are willing to, to commute. Although I think it's an easy commute, but people have to be, you know, committed to that. And our jobs are in Winnipeg too. So not everybody has to commute, but our, you know, your higher project managers are going to be coming to the office and, and so on. So, uh, but I think if we can uh, continue, uh, the, the interest is to keep them long-term. So when you have people, when you get the right person and they fit into the culture and they have fun doing what they're, you know, doing their work, I think you can keep them, which is, which is really the, really the second part. So you find them, how you keep them? Because uh, we know that our, uh, our people are getting phone calls every week from somebody trying to mm -hmm. hire them. Yeah. So, you know, those are those are very serious issues that we run into these days. Well, and that's the money and culture are key. And it sounds like you're really because you talk about the buildings that you're building and it's all about the culture and about, you know, uh, it's not just a building. And I imagine that that philosophy internally must uh, resonate as well. And, and, and that would be something that would keep people sticking around. It's, uh, it's not just about the money, but we believe in what we're doing. We're working for these clients for the right reasons. And that must be inspiring mm -hmm. for people. Yeah, and we have to make sure that that people understand uh, when we say you know do the right thing. Yeah, we have to have that conversation. What does that mean? Because uh, in today's world, you know, everybody has their own right thing. You know, this is my right thing. This is my truth. Well, we got to get on the same page yeah. as to what is what are what are we going to say? Is what are what are our values corporately, and and are we willing to pull together on those values? Because if you don't, you're gonna just not going to last. 
you you started this when you were 20 you know in your early 80s uh it's a few years since then now where do you see the next five or ten years for the business uh, going for you it's because the evolution has been significant since day one uh where do you see the next five to ten years for the for for three way well we're we're in a transition and we're a growing company which is which is great i've got a partner now uh, you know, we started talking secession many years ago. My bank forced me into talking about it when I was 40, uh, which I, uh, I just, you know, I did put a plan together, but it was uh, was a fairly simple plan, but it was a plan nonetheless. Uh, they were worried if I got hit by the buck or bus or my plane crash that I would they'd have some plan in place. So, so we did that. And I actually appreciate that because it got me thinking early. So, uh, you know, we, as a family and stuff, we put, uh, you know, we, about 11 years ago or so, we started seriously talking about how was that going to look. And so I, I have uh, my son-in-law actually is, uh, has bought into the business over time and is a partner, the major partner. So our transition, uh, you know, we're well along on the, on the transition with our, with our company. So I think that's, um, that could be a whole other topic of transitions, but it's, uh, I think it's important that um, that you have that solidity in place to, uh, in order to say what what does the next five years look like? I think the next five years are actually very exciting for us. I think we have the right people in place. We're we're looking for a few more, but we have a very good core. Uh, we have I'm the founder of the company, so I'm uh, you know I'm I'm uh, I'm an entrepreneur, but you know entrepreneurs uh, most of times can only take companies to a certain level. And uh, and you know you need other people with other skills to move it forward. And I think we've uh, we've got those skills in place. So so for I think it's good for our clients to know because they also want to know what's you know are you guys just is this going to be it or are we going to be be moving? So uh, I was uh, I was in a meeting many years ago as a dinner with a uh, um, uh, uh, John Maxwell. So he's a leadership guy and and uh, he was talking about secession. Uh, he made a uh, he made a analogy with the secession to uh, uh, to uh, uh, a relay race, and he said the one of the important things is that the person who's handing off the baton needs to be running as fast as he can when he's handing it off, and the person who's taking it has to be running. So you can't like stop and say, okay, well, where am I going to hand it off to now? You got to keep going. You got to hand it off so that you have that smooth transition. I think that's really where we're at right now. So uh, I think it's a good thing. I think it's it's healthy. We've been there for you know we've been do, doing that for a while. Uh, my son-in-law has been with me for nine years now, so he's had a good good transition, and uh, uh, we're moving forward in that way. So I think it's it's exciting. We're gonna. There's a lot of challenges I think in in our industry, but I think there's opportunities as well. Yeah. It's definitely an interesting time, but uh, you've been through it all for the last uh, 40 years. Um, and uh, I think you've probably you know, weathered enough storms to know uh, and predict potentially how you'll transition through the next one, no matter what happens. And uh, Len, I appreciate you joining me today on uh, Constructive Conversations. Thank you for having me. Thanks. This has been Constructive Conversations, Building Canada Stories. I'm George Affleck, your host. Thanks for joining me as we dug into the foundations of Canada's construction industry, learning from leaders and pioneers in the business.